We have the privilege of having a guest speaker here today from Harrisburg. He's known to many of us, but not all of us. Mike and Mercy uh, have been part of Grace Covenant Harrisonburg for a long time. They're a rich blessing, and it is, is just a joy to have them, that they've been willing to come down and to speak and to serve at this time. And uh, Mike grew up in northern Pennsylvania, but he's been in Harrisonburg since 1997. And in 2003, he became part of the staff at Grace Covenant Church in Harrisonburg. And he's been serving there in various capacities uh, with missions, with college ministry, with small group ministry. He has a Master of Divinity from Eastern Mennonite University with specialization in church and mission. He is here at my invitation to come and share with us the Word of God that uh, has been put on his heart. And I believe today he's going to be talking to us about hearing from God. So, Mike, please come. Welcome. It's great to have your whole family with us. Thank you. Y'all have a beautiful building, by the way. Do you know that? We live, our church lives in a big metal box. So when we come here, I'm just in awe of the stained glass and everything. But Well, um, I just want to thank you, Steve and Jane, for having us here. It's a real privilege. You guys are an inspiration to us, both of you, really, with your consistency your gentleness, your sincerity, your endless energy. I mean, it's a real inspiration to us. So. It's running low right now. Ah, you'll be okay. Um, we actually live halfway between Harrisonburg and here off Roman Road. If anyone knows where that is, go up out Spring Hill and then Roman. So we come to Stanton a lot. And we like it because partly when we come to Stanton, we can just do our thing in Gypsy Hill Park and go to the Mill Street. And it's kind of like going way out of town for us because it's, it's totally different. But I read something very interesting this morning. Uh, I was just curious a little bit about the history of Stanton. Everybody knows Stanton has this dynamic history, right? Well, this morning I read... Um, on a website, it said, Stanton received its name of the Queen City of the Valley because at one time it was the county seat of the largest county in the world, larger than Germany or France, even larger than, the, than most of the principalities of Europe. Is that true? Do you, do you... Yeah. It was the capital of the Northwest Territory for about 30 years. That was from, this is from, um, this is on Stanton website, so it must be accurate. <laughs> but I read that and I was like, Stanton at one point had a major, major voice in, in this part of the world. It was a city of real significance. And I thought about the people who were a part of the leadership of the city at that time and how critical it was that they hear what they heard was incredibly important for the people around them. Not just for themselves. What they heard as the leaders of this little city was very important for the rest of the, of the world at that time. And I thought, what if that's still true? And what if each, each of us, and I include myself in this, because we actually live closer to Stanton than we do to Harrisonburg downtown. What if what we hear as individuals and what we hear as a church is equally, if not even more important for the world today? I don't think it's a what if. I think it's an absolute truth. I think what we hear from God is very important for this world. 
I got, um, I got down here just a little early this morning, and so I drove around through the neighborhoods. And as I, was, as I was driving through the neighborhoods, I saw these people coming outside, and they were not heading to church. And I thought, I thought of the, the fact that all of the people here in Stanton, every single one of them, were created in the image of God. Whether or not they know that, whether or not they want anything to do with God, they were all created in God's image. We were created in God's image specifically so that we could hear from God, relate to God. We were given senses, ears, eyes, minds, emotions, so that we could live in constant communication with God, so that He could guide us, comfort us, give us creative ideas. In John 10, Jesus told His followers in a variety of ways that we should be able to know His voice. Yesterday, we were at Dalvat State Park, west of Lexington, and there were hundreds of kids all over the place. And one time, there were these kids yelling, and there were all these kids yelling, and this one kid was like, Daddy, Daddy! And I was like, looked over, thinking, that's my girl, and it wasn't even my daughter. But we're drawn, like, I think the point is, we are drawn to the voice of God. And this isn't a gift for us alone. God wants to guide us. He wants to guide you as individuals into something that your whole family, your school, your work, people need. People really need it. I think God wants to tell each of you something specific. He wants to tell you that He loves you because the people that you live with the people that you relate to, and I appreciate what was your name, Charlie, the, the word you had. God has such a deep love for people that he wants to communicate through us. That's why he put us here. Every day, God is trying to create new life in each of us. He's trying to speak new words of life into each of us. That's what he lives for. God's enemy... And our enemy has the exact opposite purpose. He wants to kill everything that the Creator creates. And the enemy's primary objective is to destroy your relationship with God. Because the enemy knows that that connection with God is the source of everything good. If he can destroy your relationship with God in any way, everything else takes care of itself. Jesus said in John 10, verse 9, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. That song we were singing this morning, the resurrecting king is resurrecting me. I love that passage because it's not just back when I was 21 and I, God resurrected me and that was a great thing like forever ago. No, God exists to continually be resurrecting us every moment of every day into new life. The key to discovering, you might say, the life you've always wanted is to listen for and follow the one who created you in the first place. I want to pray briefly. God, I ask right now, and I can ask this with confidence because I know it's your will. I ask that you would open our ears, God. We don't want just another normal ritual. We don't want some religious activity, God. We want to connect with you this morning. I ask that you would speak words of life and hope and challenge and inspiration into every one of us today. 
God, I pray that you would protect us from all the crazy things that want to distract us right now. Give us clear hearts and ears to hear from you. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So today I want to talk about five different barriers that we encounter in trying to hear from God. What do I do? Right? Left? There you go. It's pretty straightforward. I give the numbers, so if you... Okay. There we go. Okay, very good. So, five, five barriers that we encounter in hearing from God and a few strategies to help us overcome those. Asking, listening, facing the truth, growing in community, and sin. These are five different things. I'm sure there's more, to, more than that, but these are the five that I've been meditating on lately. The first barrier we all encounter in hearing from God is that some of us are simply not asking God to speak. Some of us might be talking at God, kind of like lecturing God, but we're not asking God to speak back to us. Sometimes we find it hard to ask for anything, right? We can learn from our children or maybe our grandchildren on this one, right? Children don't have any problem asking for things. Can I have some chocolate milk? Can I have a new pair of sneakers? Can I have so-and-so over for a play date? Can you help me with the, this crazy math problem? Children, it's just normal. They ask because they know they're gonna, you're going to respond. And if you read the Gospels, the stories of Jesus, you'll see countless numbers of people just asking for help. That's what prayer more or less is initially anyway. Help us, help us out here, God. And the Christian life begins simply by asking, will you forgive me? Will you help me out here? Will you love me? And your new life starts every time you ask God in faith to give you something. So it's in that initial ask that we become Christians, but it's the continual asking, appropriate asking, that moves us from fans of Jesus to real followers of Jesus. Followers of God are guided all day, every day, asking God for all kinds of direction. Jesus said in his famous sermon, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you'll find. And then a little later he says, if you then, though you are evil, thanks a lot Jesus, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? I think it's some kind of a religious it's, I think there's actually some pride, some kind of spiritual pride in us sometimes. It's like, I'm not asking for anything else because God's already been so good, I don't, I don't want to ask. The Apostle James said, if anyone lacks wisdom, ask God and He'll give it to you. The author of the letter to the Hebrews encourages us, go to God, ask God with confidence. We can only ask with confidence if we believe He's good and He wants to give Himself to us. One of the biggest reasons we don't ask is we don't think it'll make any difference. We don't know that God cares about the little bitty details of our boring lives, right? But the thing is, asking is a little bit like exercising. It's like this muscle, faith, asking. If you don't keep asking in faith, what, if you don't keep exercising, you atrophy. And then you just don't even bother. So I just want to give you permission, I dare you, actually, if we can do that as Christians. Ask God for something today. Baby asks. So the first key to hearing from God is simply to ask God speak. Second, 
You know, maybe you're, maybe you're a pro at asking, but you're not really hearing much from God. The second barrier to hearing from God is what we might call confused listening. Confused listening happens when either we're not taking the time to listen to God, we ask, God, what do you think I should do about this situation? Uh Uh-huh, okay, and then we're just gone. Or, what we're hearing is confusing to us. First, let's address this impatience factor. It's extremely common in our day and time, right? God can and will speak to us any time. But how many of you know that if you're, you're, you're in the morning, you're, you're making your coffee, you're stressed out about a situation with someone, and you briefly ask God, God, what should I do about this relationship or this weird thing at my work or this health problem or financial problem? How many of you know he doesn't often speak right there in the second? It'll be like an hour or a year later. But he will speak. I think he wants time with us. He wants relationship with us. What kind of a relationship would it be if someone you cared about, you talked to them, but you never listened to them? I've got some... I mean, the, the, the thing about living in the Shenandoah Valley, there's so many wonderful Christians here. You know, we don't live in a place where the gospel is brand, brand new. A friend of mine, David Mahagan, he's a farmer and a masonry contractor. He gets up five o'clock in the morning and sits in a chair in the pitch dark and just listens and waits for Father to speak. That's how he relates to God. This, uh, a woman who I call my spiritual director, Benedicta Early, waits on God for hours in the middle of the day, just waiting, listening for the Spirit. My wife, Mercy, sits by the window in the front of our house, just looking out the window in the morning, waiting on God. It takes slowing down. It takes, it takes waiting. And the more we listen, the more familiar we become with the voice of God. The night before Jesus was murdered, he said, look, It's going to be better for you now. Better. Because the Spirit is going to come and He's going to guide you into all truth. Inaudibly, often very simply. How many of you... Most of the times I hear from God, it's seven words or less. I don't know why. It's just inevitably. I almost never get more than six or seven words. But you know it when you hear something from the voice of the Father. So then once we're starting to hear from God, we have to take every thought captive, as the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10. We have to take every thought captive. And this is something I I like to encourage people to think about. It is critically important that we learn to distinguish the voice of the Spirit or the voice of the Father from the voice of the enemy. Conviction from the Spirit is clear and direct. He gives us a way out of the problem. Hey, Mike, that thing you just said to so-and-so this morning, you need to call them, text them back, tell them you're sorry. It's clear, it's direct, it's forward thinking, and it's hope-filled. Hey, you want to have a relationship with this person going forward? You're going to have a relationship? Get that little weird thing straight you just messed up on. It affirms our identity positively. That's not who you are, Mike. You're not a critical person. You're a kind, generous person. Make that little situation right. That's at least how I experience the spirit. Condemnation, on the other hand, comes from the enemy. It's vague and it's unclear. Hey, you know that little interaction you had this morning? That was terrible, wasn't it? What's wrong with you? Looks like that relationship's going in a sour direction. I guess that's increasingly who you're becoming. You're becoming increasingly bitter and critical, aren't you? Do you see the difference? 
And what's so important is that we learn which one to appropriately embrace and pay attention to and which one to reject and ignore. And where things get really dangerous is we em when we embrace the wrong one <laughs> and reject the right one. So we ask, we listen carefully, taking every thought captive. You know, as charismatics, we get pretty excited about hearing from God, right? I hear from God. God said, God told me. And we need to be careful with that, by the way. We don't use that as a license to just say whatever we want with an exclamation point. But we ask, we listen. The third barrier I would suggest that keeps us from hearing from God is what I call truth anemia. And I, I told my son this last night. He said, what's anemia? What is anemia? Anemia is being weak without something you should have. At least that's what it means in terms of red, red blood cells. It's like our minds, for whatever reason, slowly forget the truth and get lost. That's why we need the Scriptures. The Scriptures continually remind us of what's true. The problem is, most of us, most often, we don't believe it. And though we have the Bible, we have a bunch of varieties of Bible in our house, and we have every, app, every version possible on our phones, we don't spend time in the Bible. And so we end up with the truth deficiency. And the best way to know the truth is to just be in it. Somehow, be in the Scriptures. Find new creative ways. Don't make some legalistic, do your 15 minutes every day. Like I mean, do that. But don't be legalistic about it. We have, to we have to be recaptivated by the fact that the Scriptures have the keys to life. The psalmist David in Psalm 119 said, Your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a, a light for my path. The longest chapter in the Bible, 150 verses, every one of them, is about a love, a passion for the words, the commands, the promises of God. And the Scriptures guide us in both the big, huge, and in the tiny little decisions of life. They not only give us up-close, short-term guidance, where to put your foot next, they also give us long-range vision and perspective. Nathan Blackwell, who some of you know, one of my best friends, He's got this long-range perspective about life that it gives him this sense of peace. The 66 books of the Bible are the words of men and women who heard something from God, but not only for themselves, they heard it from God for us too. And there's just, you know what, there's just no reason for us to run around lost without any clue of how to deal with situations in life when we've been given the scriptures. All right, so maybe you're, maybe you're good on everything we've talked about so far. You've been asking God, you're listening, you're in the Word, you're experiencing truth, but you're still not really hearing anything. The fourth barrier to hearing from God is living outside the camp. That's what I call it. Living outside the camp. And this speaks to our need for community. If you were an Israelite, the first people of God, the original tribe of God, the ultimate curse wouldn't probably have been death. It would have been to be, be rejected and forced to live outside of the camp. Because it was in the camp, it was in the village, the community where the people were protected, where they were given friendship, comfort, parties, everything good existed in, in the community. So to be cut off from the community was to be cut off from every physical, spiritual, emotional blessing. And in today's family of God, 
Christians often leave their communities rejected. How many, how many people are out there in Stanton City who would call themselves a Christian, but they don't want to be here this morning? Maybe they've self-selected out of church, but that's a dangerous place to live. And our role as, as believers is to woo them as much as possible with kindness back into the community. That's, we were created for deep, authentic community. Just being in the church doesn't do it. You have to seek out a few people you will invest yourself in. It's invited accountability. It's choosing to belong to a small group, a worship team, an outreach team, a Bible study with people so radically different from you that the first time, I remember the first small group my wife and I ever led. And this person was in the group that I thought, week two, I'm going to have to quit leading small group because this person just annoys me. This is 19 years ago, a person who's become a friend to me. I don't know why it works this way, but God puts us into relationship with people who we otherwise have no business being together. But something happens when God puts us together. And God's put you, for whatever reason, on the most alive street in Stanton. Think about it. Of all the streets in Stanton, people know Beverly Street. For a specific time in church history, I believe, to help one another discern what's next for each other and for the church. Real briefly, I want to I want to tell two two old ancient stories that I wasn't sure how it fit, but I think I think this is where it goes. So I didn't I know very little about like classic literature, Greek teaching, Greek Greek stories, whatever. But I know that um, people are captivated by superheroes. The movie Endgame, which recently came out, which my boys know very much, you know, all about. The Marvel superhero movie, Endgame, is the highest grossing movie of all time. And it's highest grossing because people are fascinated about the idea of superheroes. Well, long ago, around 800 BC, there were two poets that wrote stories about these things called the sirens. Homer wrote, a, wrote about the sirens in the Odyssey. And a different author wrote about an adventurer named Jason in the Greek poem Argonautica. The issue was these voyagers at sea were warned that when they came to a certain place along the coast, there would be these beautiful, enchanting creatures disguised as these attractive, sensual women would sing them to their death on shore. Odysseus had been warned about it, and so on his way, he had his shipmates tie him to the mast and he plugged their ears with beeswax so that they would not be distracted by these sirens and be lured to shore. Self-restraint, right? This other guy, Jason, had a friend with him on the ship who when they encountered the sirens along the shore pulled out his lyre and played such a beautiful song that it drowned out the sound, the threat of the sirens. And when I reviewed those stories this week, you know what I thought? I thought, we don't need more superheroes. We need, we need to live in such relationship with people that we can help each other 
both in terms of protection and in terms of something far more beautiful. So we're not even, we're not only not threatened by the world, we're not distracted by temptation the same way. Point is, we need to be in community. It's in community where we hear from God. And the fifth barrier to hearing from God, and again, this is why we need community, is simply sin. Sometimes we end up in sin, and let's face it, we all are tempted and live in some kind of sin regularly if we're not careful. Sometimes we end up there and we wonder, how did I get here? We act surprised that we're in sin when it's really no surprise at all because we've neglected the first four. We haven't listened to God. We haven't asked God. We haven't been in the Scriptures. And we've self-selected out of deep, authentic community. Sure, we still go to church, but nobody really knows what's going on in our life. If we fall into these four, it's no wonder we're going to end up in sin. Sin is obviously one of the most overlooked, underappreciated barriers to hearing from God. Everyone sins. It's just a part of life. It doesn't give us an excuse to do it. It's just there. The problem with sin is that it interrupts, it, it disrupts our relationship with God and with others. The chronic sins of pride, greed, gluttony, etc. Et are especially dangerous because they erode our relationship with God. And the more we sin, the harder it is to hear God's voice. My hearing, my personal, my real, literal hearing, physical hearing, is going bad because over 40 years... I've been listening to too much rock and roll in my headphones, too many nail guns on job sites, too many tractors, probably too much time at Grace Covenant on our loud worship stage. Little by little, we're all going to lose our physical hearing, which is not great, but we can get hearing aids or we can learn sign language. The bigger problem is when we lose our sensitivity, our spiritual sensitivity, sensitivity to the voice of God. Sin, though, sin, it disrupts our relationship with God. David, in Psalm 66, 18, said, If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. That is one of the, that is one of the hardest things verses to read in the Bible. Sins like pride cause God to actively resist us. 22 unique times in the Bible God is said to resist those or go against those who are prideful. I don't know about you, I do not need God resisting me. There are enough other things in life going against what I want to see happen, I don't want God to resist me. I want to live with a soft, open heart to always be able to be corrected by, be guided by God. The good news is God is happy to forgive us and to restore our spiritual hearing any day, any time. He wants to restore that. And we access that forgiveness through confession in some sense, it's not sin itself that's so destructive. It's our, it's our denial of sin, this ridiculous tendency we have to pretend that we're great and everybody else is terrible. One of the greatest lies of the enemy is that if we hide our mistakes, hide our sins, they somehow don't exist and they will somehow go away. 
one of the best ways to get around that is to invite someone into your weakness. Invite someone you can trust and say, I have a real problem with this. I'm, I'm tempted with this towards hating this person or eating and drinking too much or working too much or being too obsessed with money. Will you regularly check in with me how I'm doing? Invited accountability is the only way it works. If I come up to one of you and I'm like, how are you doing in your, your relationship with your boss? You're going to be like, who are you to ask me that? But if you invite me into that, that's totally different. Our mistakes, our sins don't go away. If we don't talk about them, they just get worse. You know the only thing that survives, the only thing that thrives in the dark? Mold! Everything else you want to grow requires light. It's only when things are in the dark and the secret that they have a hold on us. And the only way we're going to get free and live totally free, open lives, receptive, sensitive to the voice of God, is to live without holding anything back. In James chapter 5, James says, is anyone in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them pray. Is anyone sick? Get some people to pray. Then he says, therefore, confess your sins to each other on your own initiative. Don't wait for somebody to discover it. On your own initiative, tell someone and pray for each other. So you can be healed. We need, we need a radically different perspective on confession. If we knew what was available to us, if we knew the lightheartedness, the relief, the sense of ease we could walk about with, we would do it all the time. Instead of it being something to run away from, we would be doing it all the time. Living without secrets voluntarily exposing every hidden, chronic, unconfessed sin, it gives us incredible freedom. It's just so counterintuitive, though. Counterintuitive, though. It just seems so backwards. Why would I tell someone my bad stuff? We do it because it's totally the opposite of what the enemy wants to do, wants us to do. It's only in the fear of God that we live without fear of anyone else. Only those who are totally transparent with God have the hope of being transparent with anyone else. But confession only happens in the context of real relationships. I thought we could... Give a few minutes for just prayer and reflection, if that's okay. If I don't know if you have somebody wants to play some keyboard or something, that'd be great. Our lives depend, really, our lives depend on being able to connect with God consistently. Your initial coming to Christ happened because you heard the voice of God. But what if that doesn't have to be just something we experienced long ago? What if we can hear from God again, all day? The church as a whole is in a new season. Stanton Grace Covenant is in a new and a very, very pivotal season. We need to take the time to listen for God to speak and we need to pay attention to these things that keep us from hearing from God. So, it, why don't we take a few minutes and just invite God to speak to us. I really believe 
He wants to speak. And he wants us to respond. I'm going to pray and give you a few minutes to speak or to listen. God, I thank you that it was your idea for us to live in intimate conversation with you. I thank you for giving us your written word to hear from you. I thank you for giving us other Christians to hear from you. God, I thank you that we can hear from you right now. And so as we each ask you to speak into our hearts right now, I ask that you would give us your truth on whatever it is. We're completely dependent on you, God, for the word of life for the word of hope, for the creative word of direction that we need individually and that we need as a church. We honor you and we pray this in Jesus' name.